We count with our fingers. A CPU counts with I.O. In our last episode, we talked about a very simple I.O. device. Remember, we're learning about memory mapped I.O., the ability to communicate with external devices, external to the CPU, using memory locations. And this simple device that we talked about was a bi-directional 8-bit port allowed us to communicate with the outside world using 8 bits, either bits coming in or out or some combination of that. And it required two registers, one, one register which was called the data direction register, which allowed us to individually assign a one or a zero to each one of the eight bits, defining whether it was an input, a one, or an output, a zero. Now, these, and then there was a second register, the data register itself, which allowed us to write values to the outputs and read values from the inputs. Now, we're not ready yet to program a GPU through a memory mapped interface, but we can move forward a little bit in our discussion. We're going to actually talk about a timer and a specific timer. We're going to look at the processor that runs this little Raspberry Pi. You may have heard of a Raspberry Pi. It's a fairly inexpensive yet powerful processor or computer that allows us to learn to program and so forth using a pretty advanced device. Now, the Broadcom processor that's in there, it has in its memory map a portion, and I believe that portion is 2 to the 26 or 64 meg, a portion that is dedicated to communicating with peripherals. It's I.O. These addresses are what we use for our memory mapped I.O. And remember, we talked about two different kinds of, of, of ways to use addresses to communicate with external devices or with I.O. One was called isolated I.O., where you had a separate memory map for your I.O. and a separate memory map for your memory. This one is actually combining this. This is memory mapped I.O. Now, so, so there's the other pieces of memory and code and so forth that are sharing the same memory space. Now, this first address, we're going to refer to this as the base address. Now, over the iterations of the Raspberry Pi, this base address has changed, but the one thing that hasn't changed is the order that you will find the devices inside of that range. The way this works is, is that when you start coding, when you start getting to the low level interface, or you know, interfacing with these memory map peripherals, you simply have one constant that you have defined that is the base address. And then when you're talking or communicating with the peripherals, what you do is you add the offset to the base address. And so if, if the, in the next iteration, this peripheral space gets moved, then all you have to do is change one variable, the base address. As long as your offsets stay the same, then we still can communicate with the peripherals you go to a new version, you simply check which version you're running, you change the base address to correspond to that version, your offsets sets stay the same, you're communicating with I.O. Now, inside of the Raspberry Pi, we have a 64-bit free-running timer or a counter. And its whole job in life is to just simply count. As soon as you turn the Raspberry Pi on, it just starts incrementing. One megahertz and it counts up. So one every, one every, every, once every microsecond, you're going to increment that 64-bit counter. Now, we've talked a little bit about this, but let me remind you that we are actually talking about memory locations that are 8 bits wide, but every time we do a load or store, every time we move something from the registers of the processor out into memory, we're typically doing that 32 bits at a time. So whenever you're communicating with this free running counter, whenever you're reading or writing to its registers, what you're doing is actually taking four memory locations at a time to total up to 32 bits. Now, 
This is a 64-bit free-running counter. So whenever we're actually communicating with the timer itself, the actual counter, the actual device doing the counting, we're going to have to do two memory operations, one to grab the high half, one to grab the low half. Now, let's talk a little bit about the registers that we are communicating with. There are going to be seven of them. And so we have got a CS, and CS is for control and status. All right. This allows us, and, and, and what we'll see is that these are some pretty simple bits that we're going to be working with in this, in this particular register. Then we have C low, which is the low half of the 64-bit timer. Then we have to have the high half, right? C high, which is the high half. Now, there's three registers. But it turns out we're going to have four more registers that are going to give us a little bit more capability with this 64-bit timer. They are C0, C1, C2, and C3. Now, these registers are referred to as compare registers. Now, each one of them is 32 bits. So we have compare 0, compare 1, compare two and compare three. All right. There you go. Now, what I told you just a moment ago was that these seven registers, they're located somewhere in this range of peripherals. So we take our base address and then we're going to add it, add to it an offset to point to these registers. Now, the base of the timer, so we have the timer base, this is equal to the base address plus a hexadecimal 3000 or a hexadecimal 30000. 3000. Three zero zero zero. Sorry. Three zeros. Now, that means that your base address plus 3000 is going to point to this block of registers. Now, these registers are all grouped together. And each one of those has an offset from this guy. Now, the, the control status, this has an offset of zero. So if you're looking at the control, if you want to interact with that register, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the base address for the peripherals plus 3000. That'll point to the control status. The low half, this is at an offset of four. Now remember, once again, every time we read, we're gonna read four memory locations. When we're reading 32 bits, we're gonna read four memory locations. So the control status actually is zero, one, two, and three. Then the next location is four. And this is gonna give us our low half of the 64-bit timer. The high half is at eight. Compare register 0 is at a hexadecimal C. Compare register 1 is at a hexadecimal 10. Compare register 2 is at a hexadecimal 14. And compare register 3 is at a hexadecimal 18. Right. Now, this timer has some very simple, well, it, it, it's, it's a pretty simple, it's pretty pr simple process. You're not going to reset or modify the timer itself. It's just counting. But one thing that we might want to do, perhaps you've got a piece of code and you want to measure exactly how long it takes to execute this piece of code. What you might do is read the low and high half. And in fact, if it's pretty quick, really all you're going to need to do is read the low half because the high half that, you know, if we're talking about, well, you know, if it's a, if it's a, if it's 32 bits, if just the low half is 32 bits, that means two to the 32 or 4 billion, over 4 billion 4 billion microseconds has to pass before that guy's going to roll over. So if you're okay with being able to just measure within 4 billion microseconds, then you'll probably be okay just interacting with the low half of this 64-bit timer. So if you want to time how long it takes to, ex and to, act to execute a certain piece of code, you read the low half, store it execute your piece of code, then read the low half again, subtract your first value from the second value, 
and that'll tell you how many microseconds has passed. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, but what if it rolled over? What if it went from all ones to all zeros in the time that we were executing that code? Well, that's okay. All you need to do is just check to see if, if the second value is smaller than the first value, and then just mathematically swap it over so that you can make sure that you're doing the correct subtraction. Now, what, now, now that would work really well, but wouldn't it also be nice to just simply have the processor tell you after a certain period of time has elapsed? Instead of timing something, instead of seeing how long it takes to execute a certain piece of code, maybe what we want to do is say, I want to know when a second has passed. All right. In that case, what you would do is you would read CLO, then add to it the number of microseconds, a million microseconds, it takes for a second to pass. Then you would go and keep reading C low to see when your, the value that you had read plus one million microseconds is equal to the C low. In other words, you've added one million, so, so you read C low. You've added one million to it, and then this guy, C low, is just slowly incrementing up, and then eventually the two of them will be equal. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah to a degree. That's actually something called polled I.O. and it's not very efficient. It's not very efficient in that what happens is is that I have to keep polling the I.O. device to say are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And that takes a lot of time from the processor. Not very good. And so what we've got are these compare registers. Now what you do with that is you take CLO, you read it. You add the one million to give you a second, right? You add one million to the value you read and then you store it in one of these registers. And the processor or the hardware, the peripheral itself actually, just simply compares, and when the two of them are equal, it sets what we call a flag to say, yep, it's equal, all right? Now, the flags are contained in this CS, control, the control status uh, register. And if you look at that, and I'm only gonna do the very last portion, and I can't remember exactly what these four bits are called, I think they're called M3, M2, M1, M0. I'm not entirely sure I'm remembering that properly. But anyway, what you've got are these four bits. Now, as soon as, let's, in fact, let's go ahead and say that we're going to use compare register three. Now, what I do is I read C low, I add my one million to it, and then I store it in C3. And the hardware of the timer, the peripheral, will simply compare C low with C3 as C low keeps incrementing. As soon as C low is equal to C3, it puts a 1 in M3. Now, this is only slightly better. What I'm going to suggest now is only slightly better than what I was talking about before. It's still polled I.O. But this time, instead of doing a compare to see if C low is equal to the value that I've calculated and stored locally, instead all I have to do is just simply read M3. And I keep reading M3, and as long as M3 is equal to zero, timer hasn't, the, the C low hasn't reached the value we're looking for. Once it's equal to a one, we know that C low has gone one million increments. It has, it has equaled our compare register uh, C3. Now, there are a couple of things that I want to talk about here. First of all, Back in episodes 46 through 49, I think it is, or I think it's something like 46 through 49, we talked about bitwise operations. And what we were doing was we could read a value from memory, and then we could do something like a bitwise AND to clear all the bits we're not interested in to see if the one bit we are interested in is set to a one. So for example, let's say that I want to see if M3 is equal to a one. I don't care about M2, M1, or M0. What I do is I read from the timer base plus zero. I read that value, that'll bring in the control status flags. 
I do a bitwise AND with zeros in all positions except M3 where there's a 1. If the result is equal to 0, I know that M3 is not set yet. If, however, it's equal to a 1, I'll know, hey, I got it, I've got to compare, all right? So, bitwise operations are really cool to be able to see which ones of these flags are set. But, after we do a successful compare, if I want to use compare register 3 over again, and in fact you should do this any time you reinitialize compare register, the compare register 3, we want to make sure that this bit is clear. How do I clear that bit? Well, the way I clear that bit is I do a bitwise and, 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 and let's, let's, let me take a step back actually. I read my control status. I read that into my register. Now, I don't want to put a zero. I don't want to just write zero to this control status register because that'll clear all the bits. And maybe some other process is using these other bits here. I don't want to clear those because that'll mess up any other process that might be depending on those bits. So instead, what I want to do is I want to make sure I only clear M3. So I read my control status, I do a bitwise AND with 1's in all positions except M3 where there's a 0. When I do a bitwise AND, it clears that, it puts a 0 there. So it will force a 0 to be in this location. All right, And then I store it. Believe it or not, there's a problem with that. I mean, I've left these bits alone. I've left M0, F, M1, and M2, and all the other bits. I've left them all alone. I've only cleared M3, right? Well, it turns out that this processor, this, this, this device, has four cores. There are four processors. And those four processors, there may be processes or even if we're doing some multitasking on that same processor, there may be other processes that are using those bits also. And so I don't want to read control status, clear, everything, clear M3, even if I'm leaving everything alone, and then store it, because that took a few instructions. And during that time, this thing is still incrementing. And what if it incremented C0 matched, it put a 1 in M0, but now the value I had read hadn't had that 1 put in there yet. And so whenever I stored it, I end up stomping on that value and putting a 0 back there. Let me try that again. Other processes may be using these bits, and those processes are happening at the same time our process is running. So, if I, am, if I have read CS and I'm modifying it and then put it back, even if I think I'm leaving it alone, leaving bits that are not mine alone, things have still been changing in this hardware, which may have made modifications to those flags that I'm about to stomp on. So, when I'm, when I'm trying to clear these bits and the designers of the processors knew that this is a possibility, whenever I'm trying to store or, or modify those bits, they've set it up so that all I need to do is write a value with all zeros and then a one, zero, 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 that's base two. So if I write this value to CS, it's got the hardware set up so that if there's a one in a position of one of the flags, when I store that, it, its intent is to clear the bit where there's a one. That seems a little weird, doesn't it? But it's all meant to support this idea of being able to multitask with one of these processors. Now, the problem is, and we'll get to this in the next lesson, the problem is, is that, as I said, we are still doing polled I.O. If I keep reading CS, checking to see if M3 is set, that means the processor, even though I'm not having to do the compares and checking to see if CLO is equal to the value that I'd stored, I'm still having to keep going out and checking. And that's not really all that efficient in terms of the processor. Polled I.O. is not all that efficient. So what we're going to talk about is the ability for hardware, hardware to tell us, hey, we've got a compare that has matched. One of these compare registers has matched. You need to service 
our our hardware so that you can take care of whatever it was that you had set that compare register for. We'll tell you, the hardware will tell you. Don't worry about polling us. We'll learn about that in the next episode.